Hello and welcome to NPS Now, your source for news and information about Norfolk Public Schools. I'm your host, Karen Tanner. I have two very special guests with me here today. We have Angela DeMick. She's our Senior Project Coordinator in Assessment, Research, and Accountability. And we have Jennifer Butts, a second grade teacher at Sewell's Point Elementary School. And we're going to talk about Kibo today. So welcome, ladies, to MPS Now. Thank you. Glad to have you on the show. That's an interesting name for an activity. So Angela, tell us um, about the Kibo Robotics Grant. Um, what does it support and which schools are involved? Yes, yeah, so we've had a unique opportunity. We actually already had a grant called Operation Break the Code, and um, we're in our third year of a five-year grant. And we have a unique opportunity to partner with Tufts University, which is a research team based um, out of Boston. And uh, Dr. Marina Bears created an amazing robot over the last 20 years that is actually being used in early childhood classrooms in almost 55 countries. So Norfolk is uh, posed to be the first district in the nation wow. to be implementing a unique pilot study uh, where we're using robotics and computer science inside of content instruction. So what schools and age groups are participating in Kibo? Yes, yeah, so right now we are using the pilot study in our eight grant schools, uh, Laramore, Terrellton, Poplar Hall, Camp Allen, Taylor Elementary, um, Sewell's Point. We have several of the grant schools who are actually already in the pilot study and some that just began the pilot study for the next six weeks. So it is a six weeks rotation where we're training all kindergarten through second grade teachers over the next year how to use this unique tool. So what is Kibo and how does this work? So Kibo is a robotic kit or program for ages four to seven. It was developed uh, by Tufts University, their research team, and it actually helps children create, helps them be collaborative, helps them uh, uh, create programs in a way that brings the robot to life, and they're learning all kinds of important things like critical thinking, problem solving skills, and uh, getting to play in the new uh, development appropriate curriculum that's going to help improve our computer science education as well as that begin next year in Virginia. Jennifer, what type of training do you have to go through to prepare to teach the students and participate in this program? Well, we went to a hands-on interactive training um, back in November. It was all of the second grade teachers and specialists, the ITRTs, from the eight pilot schools. And I mean, it was just, it was amazing. We were, I mean, we were just thrown right into it. We had the kits there. We were given the curriculum guides and we kind of like modeled exactly what we would be doing with, um, with our students. The developers were there and I mean, it was just, it was like a, a think tank of mm -hmm. us just figuring out how would we implement this in our schools. I mean, we had the curriculum, but we had to figure out how we would, um, like how we would do everything. How, how would we fit it into our day and all of that stuff and how would it mash, mesh in with our curriculum and all that stuff. So, I mean, it was a great experience and it prepared us. So how are you teaching your students essentially about coding and how have they responded to this? Um, well, we've been given a curriculum guide and it had 12 lessons. So it really, you know, it, we had to scaffold the kids into it um, gradually. So we first talked about communication and got them to thinking about the different ways that we communicate. And we talked about engineers and programmers and all of that stuff. and really talked about what coding actually was. And then they're like, oh, that's what it is? You know, because when, when people hear the term, they always think something so difficult. Difficult, yeah. So difficult, and you know, it was, when they, when they realized what it was, I mean, they just became so excited. And you know, it's like, oh, coding? Um, which is um, programming a computer to do what you want it to do. So, I mean, we have just been so excited about that in class. and they have really responded well and they want to do Kibo all day long. <laughs> that sounds exciting. Well, let's take a look at how students are using Kibo at Sewell's Point Elementary. They did a phenomenal job adapting. They started out a little like, what should I do looking for me for instructions? But as time progressed, they began to problem solve on their own. They debugged on their own. Just now even, I heard them saying things like, wait, we have to do this first. So they understand the concept of sequencing better. They understand the concept of resolving conflicts on their own. And, and it's, they've 
it's, it's showing outside of just Kibo time. Even in the classroom, they're a little more patient. They don't get so upset right away as much as they did in the beginning of the year. So it's, I mean, there's all kinds of adapting, but I love being able to teach them and know that I'm part of something that they can, they can always remember. And just, again, being able to relate it to something that they already have to do and understanding that it's not just science, not just, you know, debugging, or it's not just technology. We can relate it to everything. So I love being able to make connections throughout the day, and Kibo's really helped me with that. So I'm loving it, too. I like um, making a program. I also like, I like the part where we get to make it do stuff like when we do near, far, dark, light, because it's like you... It's like you're making it do different things just because of where, like if you put your hand and you can make it do stuff by putting your hand on top of it. I think that not every kid has an opportunity to do this and I think I am special because I have an opportunity to do this. As you can see, the students are really enjoying this. I was enjoying watching them do this. Why is it so important to teach our students about robotics and coding? Well, one of the most important things is we realize this is a part of their future. They need to mm -hmm. understand and be innovators. So what's really unique is that Virginia formed uh, in 2017 the profile of a 21st century graduate, which includes the five C's, creativity, communication, collaboration. And what's so unique about Kibo is we are actually beginning that in the early grades, the five C's. So we are building toward a 21st century graduate by using these kinds of tools. How is using Kibo, you think, helping with the other instructions with the students? Oh my gosh, it's helping everywhere. Um, we, we make connections between using Kibo and like social science, for example. Um, we started our unit on past and present and the kids are like, oh wow, the way that technology is changing, they didn't have Kibo in the past. Um, we talked about um, there is a, a certain programming block that includes if statements. If this happens, then this will happen. And the students made the connection between that and science. That's like making a hypothesis. Um, mm -hmm. Using the programming blocks with math, like in math, it's like patterns. Um, in language arts, I mean, reading, writing. We have design journals for Kibo where we write out our programs. We talk about what we want to do. Um, they go back in and they edit their programs if things aren't working well. Um, connections everywhere to our curriculum. Future scientists. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, cool. so Angela, you know, ultimately, what do you hope that these young students will take away from this Kibo experience? Well, there is new research that's beginning to show that early focus on computer science opportunities is actually increasing the exposure for um, females and minorities in ways that could p potentially alter their future course in jobs and careers. So we are excited to bring in a tool that can be actually show teachers easily how to engage computer science into what they're already doing. And then we're also excited that it's going to help prepare teachers for the new Virginia SOLs. We're the first mm -hmm. state in the entire United States that voted mandatory kindergarten through 12th grade SOLs in computer science that begin to roll out next year. Since then, over half of the states in the United States have passed some form of legislation, and we anticipate all 50 states are going to do this because the jobs of the, of the future involve STEM and STEAM, yes. those kinds of skills, and the, again, the five C's, the 21st century graduate, we need to begin being intentional and in building that in the early grades. They say coding is the new literacy, that you could almost become bilingual, if you will, by learning to speak computer science and coding languages. And then we'll also be able to pre prepare teachers to, to learn this skill, to be able to prepare their students, because then when they get to middle school and high school, they'll begin to choose things like AP computer science mm -hmm. that's now uh, able to be counted as a foreign language credit when they graduate. So we're excited about beginning to, that from the very early ages. And Jennifer, with you in the classroom, what's the most important thing you think your students are learning by using Kibo? I would say the most important thing so far, um, I mean, it's tons of them, but problem solving. They have become expert problem solvers using Kibo. Um, you know, whenever you're exposed to something new, it can be difficult, um, but this hasn't been like anything else. 
they have been so excited to do it that, you know, any challenge that comes their way, I mean, they're just talking and thinking and, you know, what can we do? And I mean, it has brought them, I would say it's brought them closer together when they work in groups because they know they have to work together to figure things out. And it, you know, it spills over into other things as well. And, you know, sometimes when they come to me with things, I say, are you using your problem solving skills? Yeah. And they say, okay, <laughs> we'll go back and do that. Right. And then, Sounds yeah. like a maturity level too. Oh yes, absolutely, yes. absolutely. So Angela, are we looking to expand this program beyond the eight schools? Yes, we're very excited. We just finished a very difficult grant through the Department of Education. We just submitted a proposal to take what we're doing into all 32 elementary schools. Wow. We uh, hope it's very competitive, but we think it was well written. Tufts University actually approached us based on the success of our pilot study and ask if we would consider um, replicating into all of the elementary schools. So we'll find out in August wow. if we get it, which would be yes. very exciting. Yes. And we really think that Norfolk could be the leader for the state of Virginia in building an early childhood computer science curriculum and framework. And then we hope that we can inform other states as they also begin to roll out their computer science. What standards. an honor for Norfolk Public Schools. Yes. And, yes. And, and a great thing for parents and students to participate in. Thank you both for coming on the show today to talk about the Kiva program in eight of our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Yes, yeah, so we want you to stay tuned for more NPS Now. Welcome back to NPS Now. I'm Steve Sutmiller, Senior Coordinator of Athletics. Today in the studio, we have are going to talk about middle school sports and we have an athletic director Chris Harris from Lakewood Middle School <laughs> welcome thank you all right Chris let's, we've had a busy year um, and now we've just finished our winter two season and we're moving into spring but we want to highlight uh, some of the the great things that happen in winter two so let's talk a little bit about winter two and, and let's start off with forensics uh, forensics uh, Academy for Discovery at Lakewood won forensics uh, again this year I had a great season um, and then in boys basketball, very competitive season. Lake Taylor boys won. Mm -hmm. uh, and they have a really young team, so we'll probably see them back near the finals again next year. Uh, in girls basketball, we had Blair had a great overtime, mat, uh, overtime game against um, Norview, so they won uh, girls basketball. And then in competitive cheerleading, uh, Lakewood won that for the second time in a row. They okay. won last year as well. All right, very good event uh, that just ended. Right. Um, some other teams that, that we can highlight in that, uh, this was the first time um, a Portsmouth team uh, placed um, in, in the cheering event, uh, and they were followed up by Blair Middle School. Right. So um, a, a really good event. But this, going back to the basketball a little bit, um, because it's a, it's a big um, draw for right. us. Uh, you know, talk a little bit about the semifinals, where we have it, um, and just uh, from there. Well, the great thing is we, we get to have it at a high school gym. We had it at Norview High School, and you know it's a packed house. It's uh, just an incredible event. Uh, you know, middle school kids get to play in a mm -hmm. kind of a big time environment for them, and you know, it's very exciting semifinals uh, on on both sides, boys and girls. All right. So, I mean, t talk about crowds. Uh, the middle school cheering. Uh, you know, we had a, an <laughs> right. excellent crowd. So, yeah, what, what is it for an athlete to uh, perform uh, not only in, in the sport but uh, but the cheering event in front of uh, that many people? Right. And like you said, cheerleading was also at Norview High, and uh, I, I know our girls were just, just super excited to be there. And um, you know, parents had great things to say, and just it was a well-run event. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just a real exciting day. Yeah. So a lot of work put into that, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but the end result was, uh, was you know, a, a nice turnout for everybody. Right. So let's, um, all right, so we just highlighted the winter. Um, now we're, we're, we went right into spring. We didn't have a right. break. So uh, let's talk about the spring sports uh, and what's available um, out there for the yeah, so we, athletes. Yeah, so as athletic directors, we don't really catch a break. We go from one season to the next. And a lot of our athletes do too. Most of them play three, four, five sports throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, hats off to them because they don't get a break. So we go right into baseball, spring sport. Uh, we have boys and girls track, uh, and we also have field hockey. Okay. And then after, uh, towards the end of spring season, we've added a new season this year, co-ed tennis, which will be a new uh, sport for us this year. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's talk about co-ed tennis uh, and why, you know, why did we go to this format? Because before we had boys right. in the fall, 
girls in the spring, but now we've kind of married it together. So talk about um, some of the reasons why we went through this, uh, this well, way. One of the side factors was uh, we just had low participation for, you know, some of the schools sometimes couldn't field a full team. Uh, so we wanted to make it more competitive for all the teams. So we felt like if we combined boys and girls into a one team, we'd have uh, you know a better turnout and we wouldn't have as many forfeits. Um, we also decided to go to a, a new season because, again, a lot of those girls and boys play other sports as well. So we didn't want them competing with, uh, you know, if they had to play baseball, you know, they might pick baseball over tennis. So we wanted to create a new season. Okay. Um, so it wouldn't conflict with any of our other sports. All right, so let's talk about the format. Right. Um, again, it, it's a little different, so uh, I, let's, let's talk right. about a tennis match on, that, on, on the Tuesday. What's it gonna look like? Um, so this year it's gonna be, you're gonna have four singles uh, for the boys, four singles matches for the girls, and then we're gonna do three mixed doubles. Okay. So we're gonna take three players from each side and they'll combine for a doubles team. Uh, so that equals uh, 11 total matches. Um, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a larger format than we did for boys and girls tennis, um, but we think it's you know, going to be you know, real competitive and it's going to be pretty exciting this year. Okay. So um, facility-wise, I, I know we have some challenges yeah, right, we do. Uh, at our middle schools to, to host that many matches. So right. we're, we're fortunate to go to Norfolk State, right. Old Dominion, Northside Park. So we have some good facilities that these uh, athletes can, uh, to, th that will be able, they'll be able to perform uh, on. So um, a, a little bit more about tennis. Let's talk about the tournament, because that's going to be a little right. different as well. So we kind of separate it a little bit and then and bring the mix back. So. Yeah, so, you know, it's going to be a big event. We're going to have, you know, like uh, a boys um, tournament, and we're going to have a girls tournament, and it's going to be going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to have the mixed doubles as well. So, you know, it's going to be over three days. Uh, you know, again, like you said, luckily we're, we're going to host it at Norfolk State. Uh, they've been great, um, as well as ODU has been very supportive of tennis in Norfolk. Um, so we're just, you know, we're lucky to have those people supporting mm -hmm. us, and you know, hopefully we can get it done in three days. But yeah. we'll, we'll see. Pray for good weather. Pray for good weather. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that, that's definitely a change. Right. Um, we obviously we think it's going to enhance uh, the, the middle school program tennis-wise, and then hopefully moving on to the high school programs right. uh, where they'll, they'll benefit from that. So <clears throat> we have all these sports, right. okay, from we have fall, winter one, winter two, spring, and now spring two. Um, we have a, a big award at the end for the best athletic program. So talk a little bit about the Superintendent's Cup um, and then and how, how are points awarded. And right. So the Superintendent's Cup is basically it's, it's determining who, I guess you would say, the best middle school program is. And the way we, we do it is you accumulate uh, points for how each of your teams finish during the regular season. So obviously if you finish first in the regular season, you're going to get the maximum amount of points. If you finish last, you're going to get the least amount of points. And then we also give bonus points for semifinal wins if you have a tournament style for your sport. And then if you're the overall winner, you're going to get some extra points as there as well. And so. Uh, I haven't seen the results after the winter one season, but I'm guessing Blair's going to be probably uh, in first place right now um, over Lakewood, and I know some other teams are mixed in there with us as well. So it's going to be super competitive. It's going to come down to probably uh, co-ed tennis is what I, I mm -hmm. think. And, you know, it's up for grabs. It's anybody's cup right now. Okay. Well, this is the fourth year, right. uh, and, yes, you are the reigning uh, champ. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, that cup's, cup is sitting in uh, – yeah, we, Lakewood uh, proudly. Yeah, so, our, um, our kids want to keep it too, so we're going to try. But you know, Blair's going to be you know they're a tough tough school to compete against, and uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, well, um, you know, let's let's talk a little bit about you know what what's coming down the pike. What what are some new things that that are being discussed at the uh, at the at the meetings uh, and trying to enhance the uh, athletic programs? Uh, well. All, a lot of this is going to be on a club level. We're not going to add a new uh, so-called varsity sport in middle school, but we're looking at golf right now. Um, we, we, we've been putting um, you know, information out throughout the, all the schools, and we get a lot of interest. You know, kids who may have never played golf before, they're interested in it. So we're looking into that. Um, we have golf courses that are going to you know, donate um, their, their courses for us to play for, at no charge. So. Um, hopefully by next year we, we get the club in place, you know, club tennis. 
Uh, we're looking. We've been looking at um, cross country as well. Mm -hmm. That'd be another club sport, and then possibly swimming. We we have uh, students at every single school that uh, are involved in swimming right now, and you know. The great thing about sports is we, we want people that have never tried it before too to, you know, hey, may, maybe swim's my thing. So they, you know, yeah. you know, that's that's why all these club sports are going to okay. be uh, real successful. We think. All right. Well, um, a lot of good information. Uh, exciting times uh, at the middle school level. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of competition uh, upcoming. We can always find out about the competition by going to the different websites. Right. Uh, uh, at the, that the schools have. So it's it's really um, packed full of information. So. Um, you know, if there's any questions, they can definitely follow your, uh, their school uh, through those websites. Yeah. So, um, Chris, uh, a lot of good information, and uh, we appreciate you, everything that you do. Uh, Thank you. you know, a lot of hard work there, <laughs> um, but uh, very rewarding. So, appreciate you coming down. Thanks for having me. More NPS Now after this. Welcome back to NPS Now. With us today is Rhonda White. She's Senior Coordinator with Math. And we're here to talk about Math and Statistics Month for 2019. But first, welcome to the show. Thank you. <laughs> Excited to talk about math all the time. Mm -hmm. Seems like we have you on the show all the time. We I just had you in February. Like that. So it's some great things happening. So you were on the show in February to talk about the new math standards. Is there any additional information you want to add about that? Well, first of all, just to reiterate that we do have the new 2016 standards this year in full implementation for all of our grade levels. We do, however, have a slight change from the last time that we were here. Now, I told you to just, you know, for parents to be aware that we do have a new test this year for our new standards. Mm -hmm. So that will be very different. But we also have been extended the time frame for us to transition to the Desmos. So the state of Virginia, they looked at how some districts were handling the transition and the technology that was available and the training, and they just felt that it would be best that this spring not be the first time that our students have to use the Desmos online calculator. So instead, they've extended that window until 2021. So up until then, students will either be able to choose a handheld, or the Desmos calculator. Okay, and hopefully parents remembered that conversation that we had about yes. the Desmos yeah, calculator. So when are the math SOLs this year? Well, we're given a window by the state, and our window is about the third week of May through June. However, each school is able to really make a schedule of when they are actually going to administer the exact date for the math SOL. So that's why I really encourage parents to stay tuned into schools and the emails and the phone calls because they will let them know when exactly their students will actually take the math SOL. And then how can you all help parents prepare their children for the math SOLs? Well, you know, I, I strongly encourage parents to go to VDOE. Looking at the Virginia Department of Education's website will give them access to things like what the CAT test is like for students in third through eighth grade math. They have something called the computer adaptive test. Mm. And so parents can get a really good feel for what that's about. And they can also see examples of items and how those technology enhanced items students will have to engage in that. And it's broken down for grade levels so they'll know fourth yes. grade, third grade, fifth grade. All the way through algebra too. Oh great. So I spoke about this earlier. April is math and statistics month. Yes. What are we doing here in the district to talk about this or to celebrate it? Well, I'll start by saying that schools are given the autonomy to be as creative as they can. Um, in the past year, I've heard people talking about having math nights in grocery stores to engage oh, their community. Mm -hmm. um, they have special competitions, problem solving activities, weekly problem solving activities, math bees. So all kinds of creative things just to get students excited about math. But as an entire district, we also host the Math 24 competition in April. Yeah, I'm looking at this beautiful trophy right here yes. that you brought with you today. So what is the Math 24 Challenge? Well, it's a game. It was actually created in, what, I think 1988 um, mm. by a man who just wanted students to explore looking at patterns and numbers and to do it in a challenging way, but in a way that they can look at those patterns and see the relationships of numbers. So how is the game played and uh, what are the ages of the kids that can compete? Well, there's an actual website you can go to 
for Math 24 and to engage your students in it, you can actually buy a box set. Oh, that's neat. Of the 24 game. Or you can go to firstinmath.com and get more information. You can get a mm -hmm. subscription. Some schools actually have a subscription. But what they're doing is they're looking at the numbers on a card and they have four digits. We play the single digit version. You could play two digits. You can use variables. You can use fractions. We're sticking to the single digits for our fourth and fifth graders who will compete. And what they have to do is to look at the four digits. Using all four digits, they have to use any of the operations. So that's addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division to make the number 24. So for example, this card, I could challenge our studio audience, but <laughs> <laughs> they could actually look at this card and say, hmm, how can I make 24? Oh, I see eight and three. Well, then they have to then tell me how they found eight. Eight times one is eight. Four subtract one is three. Eight times three is 24. Oh, you're really making the kids think. Yes. And the adults. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find this uh, this Math 24 Challenge game online? Yes. So you can actually get the app for your phone. You can have it on your tablet. They can have it at school, which many schools do. And again, they can go to firstinmath.com. And it's an entire game series. It also has some other skills. But the basic skills are really pushing those fluency skills, being mm -hmm. flexible with numbers, and then moving into also that automaticity, which is just a fancy way to say being fast. So we have the yeah. flexibility and then we have the speed as well. How competitive are students with this game? <laughs> Extremely competitive. I mean, to be able to bring the trophy back to your school is definitely something that they have the bragging rights. But for many students, when they come, they're able to network and just talk with other students from across the district. We make sure that at all times students are able to play. So even in the final round, when you have just four students competing for the, the actual trophy, everyone is still at a table, still talking and still actually playing the cards because we want them all to just realize that we have something in common no matter where we're from this game is one of those things how many winners really um, so, can win this so trophy? in the end there's just one first place but we have a second a third a fourth we do honor um, not a fourth an honorable mention so that everyone actually walks away with some sense of an um, accomplishment but we do have the three ribbons given mm -hmm. so how does celebrating math numeracy and mathematical literacy work? Well, just like with the Math 24 game, the owner of the creator of the game actually says that this game takes away some of the anxiety because you know the answer is 24. So we can celebrate the process and the beauty of solving the problem. And whenever we're doing things like that for Math Month and we're helping students to kind of lessen that anxiety and helping them to see a fun way to celebrate math, to continue to learn your skills, your facts, and then we're really helping them to gain that, I call it self-efficacy again, that confidence. That's mm -hmm. a part of building their mathematical literacy. And then they'll be able to go out in the world and then apply those skills in other areas. Okay, well I have a fifth grader, so yes. I'm going to download that app yes. <laughs> <laughs> and practice with her. Thank you, this is very innovative and I'm excited to see which students win this year. Yes, we are too. <laughs> Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you. And we want to thank you for watching MPS Now. It airs weekly on WMPS, Channel 47, or you can view us online at www.mpsk12.com. If you have any great story ideas or events happening at your school, email us at mpsnews at mpsk12.com. Again, we want to thank you for watching NPS Now.